Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live streamed program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club, and our moderator for today's program. Today's program is part of the Commonwealth Club's new Future of Democracy series, generously supported by Betsy and Roy Eisenhart. The club has, of course, shifted from in person programs to all virtual events like this one, and we're so grateful for your support. We're happy to present today's program free to our viewers and appreciate you considering donating to the club. If you wish to do so, text the word donate to 415-329-4231 or visit the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. We truly appreciate the support. We also want to remind you to submit questions for our guest via the chat room next to your screen and I'll get to as many of them as possible later in the program. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and Professor at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Dr. Diamond is a renowned political scientist and expert on democracy around the world. I've appreciated his insights and ideas for years at Stanford in his role as the director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law, where he studied the state of democratic development in the developing world, in Hong Kong, uh, the Arab Spring, and the like. Little did I expect that we would be seeing him doing simil similar analyses of democracy in crisis here in the United States. In late November of last year, well before the events of January 6th, Dr. Diamond wrote a New York Times essay about the vulnerability of our democracy especially how, in his opinion, free and fair elections are under far more direct threat than many had ever imagined was possible. In his essay, Dr. Diamond predicted that President Trump might pressure the Republican legislatures in battleground states to award him their state's electors, even if the formal vote-getting machinery ultimately declared a Biden victory in the state. He further said that such a scenario would be far more dire than Bush versus Gore in 2000, with an incumbent president threatening fire and brimstone if the election were not handed to him and signaling violent right-wing extremists to take action. Dr. Diamond's predictions were so right, as we now know, uh, after we've experienced the events of January 6th. And of course, the second impeachment trial of President Trump is underway as we speak. Drawing conclusions from the underlying trends he sees in the U.S., Dr. Diamond says our electoral system needs basic reform. He says that newer democracies have taken measures to depoliticize courts and have independent authorities to investigate national level corruption, while our Congress largely investigates itself. He says such measures never occurred to our founders because democratic norms and outcomes were clear enough to avoid catastrophic conflict over a national election. He concludes that, quote, today we are far closer to a breakdown than most democracy experts, myself included, would have dared anticipate just a few years ago, end quote. Today we'll discuss the agenda for reform in America's institutions uh, that Dr. Diamond believes may be needed in order to preserve our democracy. Dr. Diamond will make some brief remarks and I'll then return to have our discussion with him. So a big Commonwealth Club welcome, Dr. Diamond. Thank you, uh, Gloria. It's always an honor to speak to the Commonwealth Club uh, and particularly now at this crucially important moment uh, in the uh, life of American democracy as we uh, enter what uh, something like our 240th year. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge, first of all, the depth of the crisis we are still in. We had a very uh, narrow escape from catastrophe 
uh, in the period between the election of uh, Joe Biden as president of the United States in early November and his inauguration on January 20th. And the narrow escape was not only with regard to uh, the nearly successful uh, potential assassination of members of Congress and the vice president of the United States or uh, other physical harm to members of Congress and more uh, lasting interruption of the process of counting the presidential uh, electoral college vote. It was the efforts uh, on the part of Donald Trump, which are still coming to light in their breadth and intensity, and which I think could have been predicted in advance of the election. And I was hardly the only person to have done so if you were paying attention to what Trump was saying and the logic and style of his rhetoric and his campaign, the relentless efforts to suborn and subvert the electoral process and to try to pressure uh, the state legislatures in different states and the electoral officials in different states like the Georgia Secretary of State to hand President Trump a victory that he didn't otherwise win. And this was possible in part, uh, in large measure, because there was sufficient doubt about the transparency and honesty of the electoral process and the electoral uh, results that uh, the people on the losing side of the presidential election campaign, that is a large swath of Trump's supporters and not just Trump himself, could believe what they wanted to believe about the fact that he had won an election that in fact he had lost. And all of this points to urgent needs to do two things I wanna focus on briefly now, and then I will uh, answer uh, all your questions and really look forward to the dialogue we will have. First of all, we really must strengthen and insulate from partisan contamination our electoral processes. They are decayed, they are antiquated, uh, they are in need of modernization and funding, uh, they have not received adequate support and attention, and we can no longer take them for granted. And second of all, we've got to think about how we can depolarize our political process uh, so that it is not so uh, much uh, given to uh, the political extremes and toward um, the level of distrust and partisan warfare uh, that we now have coming from the extreme of one political party in particular, but the trends are toward increasingly some degree of bipolar uh, polarization. I have a 12-step program. Those of you who've read my book know I like 12-step programs. Uh, my book is Ill Winds, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacency. And in that book, I highlight the autocrats 12-step program around the world for um, undermining democracy, which Donald Trump got pretty far in implementing. So now I have a 12-step program for strengthening and repairing American democracy. The first eight steps uh, involve strengthening our, uh, the integrity and efficiency and transparency of uh, uh, election administration in the United States. Number one, we need to ensure adequate federal funding for state electoral administration uh, and for upgrading voting and counting machinery. The Congress uh, was well aware of the fact that we needed something like experts made them aware of the fact that we needed in the 2015-2016 electoral cycle, uh, $2 billion uh, in assistance to the state electoral administrations and their county partners. And the Congress only wound up being able to appropriate 400 million of that. One billion, somewhere between half a billion and a billion dollars in aid flowed from private philanthropies 
to uh, public uh, electoral administrations at the state level across the 50 states. And that should not have to be coming from private uh, charities. Uh, it's ludicrous that it would be. It's not sustainable. And we've got to get money uh, appropriations now as soon as possible uh, into the federal budget to support state electoral administrations for the next electoral cycle. Secondly, we need to prioritize transparency and verifiability in casting and counting votes. I personally think, and this gets back to the uh, debates about the voting machines that were used, uh, there's no evidence that any of them uh, were anything uh, but efficient and transparent and neutral and well administered. But the more that you have uh, a, a voting machines that you know, have a veil of uh, uh, invisibility to what's going on, the more that conspiracy theories should th could thrive. So I actually favor a simple system of paper ballots that then use optical scanners to count the vote. And of course, this is what we do anyway with uh, the scanning of, or what we should be doing with the scanning of the increasing usage of mail-in ballots. And so I think this uh, should be a common system we use throughout. Uh, as election administration experts urge, we should implement auditing of all aspects of electoral administration on a routine basis, from the voter register to the post-election auditing of the vote count. And uh, this is one reason why we need more funding for state electoral administrations so they can modernize their equipment and modernize their techniques to enable more efficient rapid counting of the votes, including the mail-in ballots, and enable uh, verifiability and auditing. Fourth, we need to protect the right to vote. I can't emphasize enough the importance of renewing and extending the Voting Rights Act to prevent and reverse efforts at voter suppression. Fifth, we should continue to modernize and make it easier to register to vote including through online registration and motor voter rules. I could uh, answer a question about same day voter registration later on. I think one of the great successes of the 2020 elections was the vote by mail and the early voting. It turns out that only 25% of the votes cast in November were at the ballot box in the United States. And this is why I think it's the main reason why we had such an increase in voter turnout because it was so much easier to vote. So let's continue to make it easier to vote and increase uh, voting by mail and early voting. To do so, seventh, we need to establish minimum federal standards for voting, uh, including standards for uh, mail-in voting and for uh, making it uh, easier to turn in your ballot uh, early if you wish, uh, and to rule out the kind of efforts uh, that frankly many Republican states were engaged in to make it more difficult to vote early, more difficult to vote by mail, to take away post boxes, to take away drop boxes for early voting. Uh, this is really, I think, unconscionable to make it more difficult to vote in a democracy. Uh, and there's no evidence, in fact, uh, that uh, one party is going to be advantaged if you let uh, everybody vote uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, so minimum standards is number seven. Number eight is strengthening the neutrality and integrity of electoral administration and certification processes at the state level. And we've seen that uh, secretaries of state and canvassing boards to certify the state election results were points of vulnerability in the 2020 election that Trump tried to compromise and didn't succeed. I fear that extremist elements may come at them in the 2022 uh, electoral cycle. So we need to think about how we can 
fortify them from inappropriate partisan influence. Now, most important is my point number nine. We need to change the incentives uh, in our voting system uh, to induce moderation uh, and induce compromise and make it easier for moderates and independents to get elected. The principal structural driver of extremism, polarization, and support for uh, undemocratic uh, political actors like Donald Trump is the fact that before people get elected in a general election, they have to get nominated in a party primary, which is always a low turnout affair. And who turns out in a low turnout party primary? It's the more ideologically committed. It's the more fired up. Uh, and now in the Republican Party, it's the more extreme elements uh, who don't represent the entire uh, Republican Party or even a majority and are very unrepresentative of the general electorate. I favor ranked choice voting in the general election where people can rank their choices as they do for your municipal elections in San Francisco. And um, I like the system that Alaska has just adopted by voter initiative last November, where they have a nonpartisan blanket primary, uh, no more uh, partisan uh, uh, selection of extreme candidates, but uh, they choose four candidates in the nonpartisan blanket primary instead of the two that we do in California. And then they advance those four to the general election and they use ranked choice voting uh, to uh, select among the four. This is one reason why Lisa Murkowski, I think now feels so emboldened to stand up to the extremes in her party. She's gonna be up for reelection in 2022, but she knows that you know, even if the Republican extremists in Alaska try and target her, she'll be one of the top four that advances to the general election. And she'll probably uh, be reelected uh, in part through um, the vote transfers and ranked choice voting that re reward moderation uh, and enable people to transfer their vote preferences if their first choice doesn't make it and um, uh, no one gets a majority of the vote and no one can get elected without winning a majority of the valid votes cast, and that tends to induce moderation. Uh, tenth, eliminate partisan gerrymandering as we did by voter initiative here in California, but there are still too many states uh, that rig the vote uh, in order to advantage the party that now controls the state. I think this is a blight on democracy that, uh, long ago should have been eliminated in all of the 50 states. And of course, now it's coming up to relevance again, because we're about to enter after the decennial census, this uh, uh, extremely politically fateful prof process of redrawing state and congressional electoral district boundaries. 11th, I'd like to eliminate the electoral college. I don't think this is possible through constitutional amendment. We do have the National Popular Vote Compact that I could address. And finally, I think we could reduce political polarization in the United States uh, by adopting term limits for the Supreme Court. So it's not such an existential struggle over every Supreme Court nomination. I favor uh, the concept of an 18 year term limit and the bill Ro Khanna uh, has uh, co-sponsored in the United States Congress that would begin to uh, implement this by uh, adding a Supreme Court justice uh, every two years, the president would get to um, uh, nominate a, uh, a Supreme Court justice. And you'd know Democrat, Republican, it didn't matter uh, that with an 18 year term limit, uh, every president would get at least two Supreme Court nominations in a four-year term. The issue is how you phase this in 
and I can speak to that as well. Now, this leaves uh, open uh, other important issues in the quality of our democracy, such as campaign finance, which I'd also be happy to address. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Gloria. I have a few questions, but I have a feeling we're not going to get to mine because our audience is sending so many great questions. I guess the first thing that occurs to me uh, with this 12-step program, all of which is very logical, we are in an economic crisis. We're in a health crisis. Uh, we have uh, a lot on our plate nationally uh, for, and uh, uh, a lot of demand on our budget. How do you envision this program of activities moving forward? How, how can we undertake this at this time? So, um, look, <laughs> some of the reforms that we need to modernize and uh, make more resilient our systems for voting and vote counting are in the big scheme of things, not very expensive. A billion dollars, $2 billion reminds me of the great um, Everett Dirksen, Dirksen line. I loved Everett Dirksen, the late Senator from Illinois, billion here, billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. But of course, when you're talking about a $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus budget, or when you're talking about um, the amount of money we spend to promote democracy around the world, which is well over a billion dollars, you know, if we can't spend that on our own democracy, I think it's a pretty uh, pathetic statement about uh, what we value. So I don't think it's, it's a lot of money actually to secure, strengthen, support, refurbish, modernize, and make resilient our systems for voting, our equipment for voting, our human infrastructure for voting, verifying and counting the vote. Uh, that can just be put into a, a spending bill and I hope adopted by a broad bipartisan consensus but uh, McConnell had, uh, Mitch McConnell, a particular view that, you know, wanted to slow walk this. Uh, you can draw your own uh, conclusions about his motives. Uh, most secretaries of state, Republican and Democrat in the 50 states want this. So that's pretty simple, I think. Uh, maybe requires a little more debate and thinking about federal standards. But look, um, I believe also we should eliminate the filibuster. It's just been uh, a, um, uh, it's turned into a regular instrument for minority obstruction uh, of uh, the majority will. And there's strong majority sentiment in the United States to ensure the right to vote. Uh, and I know that uh, renewal of the Voting Rights Act will get more than 50 votes plus Kamala Harris, uh, even if it doesn't get 60. So I, I recommend uh, that it just be done. And I don't think it's going to distract us uh, from dealing with our urgent challenges of uh, economic recovery and COVID and so on. Otherwise, on some of these other reforms, Gloria, we can't impose them. I don't think uh, it's realistic uh, to think that we can impose them by national legislation. We don't have a national consensus for ranked choice voting. So the battle is going to be state by state. Uh, Maine adopted ranked choice voting by voter initiative. Alaska just adopted it by voter initiative. Many cities like San Francisco have adopted it by voter initiative. In Massachusetts, it lost last year, but I don't think it was very well explained. And I think it's got a good chance as a result of statewide efforts. So I think it's more like the progressive era when many of these reforms were adopted as a result of grassroots mobilization at the state level. And that's where I think we're gonna make progress on some of these more structural reforms. Thank you. Um, so you've mentioned you mentioned a few names for those who aren't from the Bay Area. Rohana is a congressman from here in the South Bay. Uh, you mentioned Lisa Murkowski. Some advocates for uh, reforms. 
who do you see as the leadership? I mean, clearly there will need to be leadership at least at the state level in a number of states. Who's on, who's on the list of leaders of a movement like this? Well, uh, you know, what's interesting is in Massachusetts, most of the um, political leadership uh, in Massachusetts on the Democratic side, including Elizabeth Warren, as a matter of principle, endorsed ranked choice voting, even though when you think about it, uh, it's the Democrats who are more likely to face a political risk in Massachusetts because um, you know, certainly for the House and Senate, it's not too likely that Republicans are going to fare very well, but maybe an independent might uh, through ranked choice voting. But the Republican governor of Massachusetts came out against it. And uh, at the end, I think that helped to tip the balance against it. Uh, but a lot of um, uh, progressives and some uh, principled libertarians and conservatives are signing on to ranked choice voting as uh, really what we need is the single most important change we need to depolarize our politics. A lot of um, political science scholars have endorsed ranked choice voting. And uh, there is a uh, organization in, based in Washington called Fair Vote that has become uh, an important advocate for this type of change. There um, are a group of members of Congress, Congressman Don Beyer uh, from Maryland is one with his Fair Representation Act. Ro Khanna uh, is another who has signed on to that, that act. They favor proportional representation in multi-member districts. I have reservations about that that I could speak to, but the principle of ranked choice voting uh, is one that I, I think is gaining adherence. And most of all, I think what's exciting about the move for ranked choice voting is the grassroots support for it. Um, another uh, organization I would note that I think very highly of that was a strong advocate uh, for uh, the voter initiative in Alaska and the voter initiative in Massachusetts uh, and other voter initiatives for ranked choice voting, for transparency and campaign finance, for ending partisan gerrymandering of electoral districts is a group called Represent Us, represent.us. So kind of a clever name. And if you type that into Google, you'll get to their webpage. And this I think is really becoming one of the most important grassroots civic organizations in the United States pressing for change. League of Women Voters has been an organization, of course, we're well familiar with most of us, that has uh, at the state level in many states been very supportive of ranked choice voting and of course, nonpartisan redistricting and so on. So, you know, it's the old fashioned democracy approach. That's how we got a lot of these reforms in the early 20th century from the bottom up. Sounds like possibly a new national coalition for strengthening democracy and electoral reform. Correct. So one, you know, there's structure, the structure, uh, the funding, et cetera. And then there are the people who run and occupy offices. And I've often been uh, amused, concerned by the concept of the outsider in American politics, that um, perhaps the best occupant of political office is someone who's had no experience doing that. And in some ways, Donald Trump seemed to benefit from that concept. What do you think about the concept of the outsider who may have little understanding or concern about the, the system and the structure and so on? Well, you know, Gloria, there are two ways of looking at um, electoral alternation in the United States. One is the alternation between Democrats and Republicans. I think uh, in some ways uh, an equally interesting and consequential alternation is between outsiders and insiders. And if you look at our history, uh, there is, at least in the way they present themselves as presidential candidates, there's been an alternation uh, between outsiders and insiders. 
Um, so thinking recently, uh, Richard Nixon was, of course, an ultimate uh, insider, but ran a little bit in 1968 as an outsider. Uh, more uh, to the point, uh, after the Watergate uh, scandal, uh, Jimmy Carter very much ran from his perch as governor of Georgia as an outsider, someone coming in from outside Washington to clean up the mess and restore competence in government. Ronald Reagan, of course, uh, was a product of California. We, we, we you know, were well familiar with him. He emerged as an outsider, as a kind of um, principled citizen, if you will, running for governor as a non-politician and ran for president as an outsider, uh, critical of government rather than being of government. And then, you know, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, even though he was Reagan's vice president, obviously was the ultimate uh, insider. And then he was succeeded by, you know, something of an outsider, someone coming from the periphery again, a governor of a southern state, Bill Clinton. And so we've had this back and forth. Uh, now we've had the ultimate uh, outsider, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, coming in and, you know, I think the majority of the American people judged trashing the system, and we've had the ultimate insider replace him. So I think this is in the spirit of uh, the American founding, uh, uh, this tension between the valuing of public service and expertise and uh, really deep democratic experience and the suspicion of professional politicians. And that's just rooted in our political founding and our political culture. Um, you use the term progressive and I've been having some debates recently with people I usually agree with about the definition of the term progressive in American politics, where it has recently come to be used to describe left or even socialist, et cetera. And I think of it somewhat differently, uh, in part because the Commonwealth Club was a progressive era organization that emerged 118 years ago here in California. I'd love to hear how you define progressive. Well, I've always thought of progressive uh, the way you do uh, and uh, or have historically. And of course, uh, we are in California to a very considerable extent with our uh, voter initiative process and with uh, the recall for better and for worse um, uh, and uh, some of the other uh, changes we've had in governance in California, uh, an early model of uh, grassroots uh, reform in the progressive era, uh, dating back to the late Senator Hiram Johnson, I believe, um, and of course, Teddy Roosevelt was in many ways one of the ultimate progressives, right? Uh, in terms of introducing the mod much of the modern infrastructure of the regulatory state uh, in the United States and attacking uh, monopoly practices and uh, corporate irresponsibility and greed. Uh, and preserving our great uh, natural resources and national, creating all the national parks and so on, and fighting corruption uh, and influence peddling. I think of all of these as part of the progressive tradition in the United States, which had roots in the Republican Party as well as uh, the Democratic Party. Today, I think that historical understanding of the word progressive and the noun progressive uh, has basically been appropriated uh, by the political left, the, the, le the more left spectrum of the Democratic Party. And yeah, the understanding is uh, everyone from, say, uh, Elizabeth Warren or 
little bit further to the left, Bernie Sanders, all the way to uh, democratic socialists. And so people are going to call themselves what they call themselves. And inevitably, we're going to have confusion of language. But the way I look at it, the root of the word progressive is progress. Uh, and I've just laid out in that sense, a progressive agenda for reforming and renewing American democracy. And I don't think it should be viewed as a partisan or politically left agenda. So um, your wonderful list, uh, 12 step list, uh, just to delve a into a couple of them, how realistic is the change you suggest in the Supreme Court uh, terms and how exactly that's a constitutional change. How exactly do you think that could come about? Well, <laughs> the beauty of uh, this concept that's gaining momentum uh, is that uh, it doesn't require a constitutional amendment, uh, or at least there's a good chance uh, that, it, that many constitutional experts believe that if you do it a certain way, it could be consistent with the constitution. And I'll now explain why. Uh, the constitution specifies that members of the federal judiciary um, shall serve, I forget, without limit or without term, uh, you know, on, on good behavior or something like that. It doesn't say for life, but it's, it's the equivalent of that. But it doesn't say that members, it says there shall be a Supreme Court and other courts such as uh, the Congress shall establish. It doesn't say that members of the Supreme Court must serve for life on the Supreme Court, just in the federal judiciary. And that's the critical interpretation. So the logic is this, that legal experts, constitutional experts, the majority of them who've written about this, uh, believe that as long as the, the uh, law specified that they would um, rotate off the Supreme Court and back into the uh, senior ranks of the federal appellate judiciary, it would not be in tension with the Constitution or in violation of the Constitution, and it would not require a constitutional amendment. I think the debate becomes more interesting. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, we all know the size of the Supreme Court is not fixed in the Constitution. Now, here's the dilemma. I have historically, until Mitch McConnell uh, committed his two acts of supreme infidelity to democratic norms with regard to uh, the Supreme Court in the last few years, blocking the Merrick Garland nomination, uh, what, seven months before the November 2016 election, and then imposing uh, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett just weeks before the 2020 election. Until he did that, I have been unalterably opposed to uh, uh, changing the size of the Supreme Court because I think you get down the path of partisan manipulation of the court and it's an ugly road to go down. I still don't want to do it. Uh, but the problem is the only way you could implement uh, term limits for the Supreme Court and an every two year Supreme Court nomination with the logic that's being proposed would be in one of two ways. And that would be, first of all, what I would favor, which is to systematically rotate off the court after a certain period of time, the longest serving justices uh, and uh, have new ones come on with 18 year term limits. Uh, or once you start the process of every two years, but that some people think may run afoul of the term limits uh, of the constitutional norms. Uh, and it would create the irony, I don't know how you'd get around it, that Supreme Court judges might be asked to rule on their own tenure, which would be a conflict of interest, 
And so in theory, they should all recuse themselves and then you'd have no one to rule on it and you might actually need to impanel uh, a, a nine member panel of the federal judiciary. I mean, it's just kind of wild to even think about and I don't think they would recuse themselves. The only other way is what Ro Khanna's bill does and it makes me uncomfortable uh, to do this and I'm of two minds about it, but there may be no other way to get to it. You would just have the every two year process work and once all the existing members of the court had rotated off, uh, you know, you would have a steady state of nine members serving 18 year terms. Uh, for a period of time, that would likely result in expansion of the size of the court, but without any, you know, a priori political empowerment of one party or the other. I mean, you could implement this uh, behind a Rawlsian veil of ignorance and say that it won't start uh, in the Biden administration unless there's an opening in the Biden administration. Uh, and it would only, you know, you could pass a bill and say that this process of every two years, the president would have a Supreme Court uh, nominee would only start in the next presidential term. And then, you know, it's 50-50 as to who's going to be, uh, which party is going to control the presidency in the next presidential term. So... One audience member wants to know, what should, what should we be doing for young people for civics education? This is, our system obviously needs work. And I think many people may not understand the int intricacies of how our system works. What should we be doing in civics education? Well, I wanna say three things. So now I have a three point program. <laughs> Thing number one, more important than anything else, is please, let's have serious civic education. And um, uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of quantity. Uh, you know, schools have become, uh, school systems infatuated with eccentric subjects or sub the kind of electives you would have in college. I love it that students are studying psychology and economics in high school. <clears throat> I love it um, that they're doing other creative things with their time, but there is no more important, and of course, science and technology and even beginning to learn how to code in high school, great. There is no more important subject that students can study and must study in high school and beginning in middle school <clears throat> that, that is crucial to the future of our democracy than the history and structure of our democratic constitutional system and how um, uh, much besieged it has been. I'm reading a phenomenal book now. I just recommend to everyone uh, Four Threats the Recurring Crises of American Democracy by Robert Lieberman and Suzanne Mettler. Wow, I wish every high school student would read that book and learn how fragile our constitutional system has been throughout our history and how hard people had to labor to defend it. So point number one, more study of civics and the history of American democracy and the norms and principles of democracy, such as tolerance for opposing points of view, the importance of evidence-based uh, analysis and information. That leads into my second thing, which is a, um, a high priority of uh, our Stanford uh, uh, School of Education and the Stanford <clears throat> that we need to uh, put much more emphasis on uh, educating young people to be citizens on the internet, that is netizens, how to use 
and acquire, vet and question information on the internet. So they don't swallow whole every conspiracy theory that winds up. And by the way, it's not only on the right this is happening. There's plenty of, of young people and older people on the left. And at every point on the spectrum, they something comes across <clears throat> their Facebook page or they read it on some website and they just take it as the gospel. So we need to train our citizens on our merging uh, netizens to question what they read, to step out of the bubble of the information pocket they're in and probe around and, and assess things and get multiple points of view. The third thing that I'd like to propose is that we teach young people in America to listen to and deliberate with one another uh, with an open mind about the great issues of our time. Uh, another colleague uh, I have at Stanford, uh, Jim Fishkin, uh, heads the Center for um, Deliberative Democracy uh, at Stanford University. Uh, and I've been working with him and his uh, uh, deputy director, Alice Sue, on a project called America in One Room to bring Americans together, uh, randomly selected, to deliberate on the issues that divide us. But Jim and Alice now have a program where they're going to take this, uh, uh, this method of democratic deliberation into the schools. And of course, for better or for worse, this is the method, here it is online, uh, that we're using to engage one another. So once you are doing online deliberation, you can really scale it up. And this May, may they're going to do a very bold and exciting uh, deliberation uh, with high school students across the United States, where they'll bring them together across regions, across high schools, across ideologies and ethnicities, and have them dialogue and uh, interact with one another about some of the issues of our time. And I think learning to listen, learning empathy, mutual respect, and uh, civilized um, discussion and difference is a very important part of the educational process. Thank you for that additional three-point program. So um, I'd like to ask you whether you think there's anything fundamentally wrong with our presidential system. And this refers to an article a friend sent me from the Washington Post last week. John Kerry from Dartmouth uh, wrote about how democracies with elected presidents are more prone to backsliding, including through coups. And uh, they perform uh, uh, parliamentary uh, systems perform better in some social indicators, lower rates of poverty and so on. Do you have any sense that we might need to fundamentally change away from a presidential democratic system, perhaps to a parliamentary democratic system? Gloria, if I could start from scratch, uh, I would take the German parliamentary system as a model for the United States and build on that. Many of us feel uh, that Germany uh, today, all things considered, may have the best combination of executive structure uh, and electoral system. Uh, they have a parliamentary system, but they have a constructive vote of no confidence. So you can't bring down a prime minister with uh, opportunistic coalition unless you have an alternative coalition uh, to replace it with. So that kind of ensures a degree of stability. And they have what we call moderate proportional representation. They have multi-member districts um, uh, at the state level to choose half of their members of parliament. And then the other half of the members of parliament are chosen in single member districts. And the system is proportional overall. That is the vote for the party list determines the party's share of parliamentary seats but you've got to get at least 5% of the vote on a party list in order to be uh, to enter parliament. So that weeds out, or at least it was thought it would weed out um, smaller and more extreme parties. 
But I want to make two points. Number one, no system is perfect. For um, what, about 60 years, the German system I've just described kept extreme parties out of the Bundestag, the lower house of parliament. And then Alternative for Germany emerged and gained traction in the, um, uh, uh, in the immigration crisis. And now you have inside the German parliament, a party that may not be a neo-Nazi party, but is an extreme right party that has neo-Nazis in it. And uh, so the enemy is within now, uh, even, in, uh, even in the German system, no system is perfect. My second point is we're not going to get a parliamentary system in the United States. Uh, it would require a massive constitutional re-engineering that I think, uh, first of all, is unachievable. And second of all, when you start opening up the entire body to open heart surgery, it's a pretty risky enterprise. And what other changes might you introduce that could be extremely destabilizing? So my bias, Gloria, is toward incremental and moderate reforms and that, uh, that we phase in and learn by doing. This is why I'm such a passionate advocate of ranked choice voting. It's an incremental reform. We can introduce it state by state and see what happens and see how it works. It doesn't tamper with the single member districts that we have now. And uh, so it doesn't allow for the fragmentation of the party system, which could potentially have its own dangers. If we have proportional representation in the United States, which John Kerry strongly favors, and which I like in some respects, in some ways it will be very appealing. It will be far more representative. PR systems are much more representative of women and minorities they tend to do better in terms of attenuating inequality for reasons you can imagine, but they also uh, enable uh, the extremes to be represented in parliament more easily. <clears throat> so if you're worried about having Marjorie Taylor Greene sitting in the United States of House of Representatives now, imagine what might happen if we had the German system uh, with a 5% uh, threshold for a party list to be represented in the Congress. You'd have a QAnon party and you might have 40 Marjorie Taylor Greens in the parliament. Okay, uh, good, good concerns there. What about um, getting rid of the electoral college? This is something that has come up in every contentious election in the last 15, 20 years or so. Is that very realistic? Do you see a movement in that direction? What, 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 how should it, could it be replaced with what, how would that work? Well, I favor eliminating the electoral college. I think it's undemocratic. You know, if you go back to the Federalist Papers, uh, you see that an important motive was, for the electoral college was that our founders believed in the filters of expert judgment, uh, delegating uh, a number of vital decisions to people with better education and less driven by the passions of um, raw uh, wholesale elect electoral politics. And they thought that if you had an electoral college choosing the president, a college of wise people, but of course, back then it was wise men, propertied men, and so on, you would uh, guard against the possibility of a demagogue being elected uh, president of the United States, someone who would, in the words of Alexander Hamilton, appeal to the little arts of popularity. And of course, we have the Electoral College, and that's how we got a demagogue as president of the United States. So that hasn't worked out so well. And I think that we already have such massive overrepresentation of smaller states in the United States through the US Senate. 
I don't think there's a need to replicate it, nor do I think it's fair to rep uh, replicate it through the electoral college uh, system. So, uh, and then you get the debates over the electoral college. Look, I think the simple system here is simply uh, the national popular vote. Every other country that has an executive presidential system uh, elects its president through simple counting of the popular vote. And that's the way we should do it. I don't put it uh, high on my list of priorities, Gloria, because I don't see how we're going to get uh, uh, three quarters of the states to uh, adopt this. I don't even see uh, us getting two thirds, certainly of the Senate to adopt it, probably not two thirds of the House. And so um, the only possible option that people are looking at now is the National Popular Vote Compact. The idea, the, uh, the initiative that's underway that has been adopted by state legislatures that account for uh, about 190 or so of um, the 270 electoral votes that it's needed, that are needed to be elected president in the electoral college, that every state adopting the compact will direct and mandate that its electors vote for the winner of the national popular vote and not the winner of necessarily the winner of the vote in their state when the compact has been adopted by states that account for at least 270 electoral votes. The problem is how do you get to 270? Um, that doesn't look likely anytime soon. And then we don't know if it would um, be considered constitutional by the constitutional court, the Supreme Court. And the problem is you wouldn't find out until that mechanism had been invoked. And then you could have the crisis that someone had, uh, you know, won the conventional electoral college, uh, who won the most popular votes in a state, lost the national popular vote, was declared by the national popular vote compact to, to have been elected president through the popular vote, but then the winner of the electoral college by the old system could go to the constitutional court. It, it could be a mess. So I, I don't know. I favor the national popular vote compact. I think that we ought to give it a try, but um, it's any way we go would be risky unless we amend the constitution. So here's a, a good question that just came in. How do American voters today compare to voters 30 or 40 years ago in terms of their common sense? Well, uh, not well, obviously, uh, because we have uh, much greater scope for conspiracy theories and utter falsehoods and much less trust in the system where as regards electoral administration, for example, Distrust is not justified by the facts. Uh, we just had the best administered federal election in many decades, if not in American history, and the largest voter turnout in the United States, as you know, in over a century. And, you know, a large percent, percentage of the American public, not near a majority, but, you know, 35 or 40 percent uh, believe that the other candidate won. Uh, and so I think common sense is deeply suffering because of social media and because of charlatans in the political system, demagogues, who are feeding these blatant mistruths. So we have enormous work to do to counter misinformation, disinformation, but also address as my points about electoral administration have tried to do, the vulnerabilities in the system, the elements of weaker transparency uh, in the system that lend themselves to disinformation and distrust and conspiracy theorizing. We are getting towards the end of our time here. There's so much to talk about. I'd like to focus in a little bit on what people can do. 
So um, th this is a very long list of um, structural reforms that political scientists understand and, and think about, and you've, you've put out a great case. So what about an individual who's a business person or not in the uh, realm of politics or political science or whatever? How can somebody who's concerned and obviously may have been upset by what we saw in this last election cycle, connect with what you are saying to try to help make a difference, help make things better? Okay, number one, go to your school board, contact your school board uh, and ask to see what the civic education plan is for middle, middle school uh, and high school. Uh, and ask yourself, uh, are our kids learning enough about democracy as a concept and a value and a set of norms and about the history and struggle of this precious uh, constitutional system. What more can we do? Number two, ask uh, your local high school uh, if they can join the uh, d uh, democratic deliberation that the Center for Deliberative Democracy is gonna organize uh, this May, or if they can introduce uh, methods of group deliberation as part of the process of civic education and building norms of trust, mutual respect, tolerance for opposing points of view, and so on. Number three, visit the websites of some of these organizations that I've talked about involved in electoral reform. Represent Us, Fair Vote, the Chamberlain Project. Look at some of the other organizations that are working to defend our democratic norms and the constitutional process at this time of assault on them uh, and that are working to uh, try and depolarize our politics. So issue one, protect democracy, uh, leadership now, uh, and um, uh, no labels that's working on uh, depolarization of the Congress. Those are some of the organizations that uh, I think are worth checking out and supporting. And all of them have websites. Uh, get involved with the League of Women Voters. I think it's still a great organization that is trying to ensure electoral participation, electoral transparency, electoral uh, reform in many cases as uh, Fair Vote, the Chamberlain Project, Represent Us are, are doing. Uh, and model good behavior uh, for your kids uh, and your family. So even if you find views that are filled with conspiracy uh, theory um, or uh, involve really kind of some odious elements, try and search for common ground and uh, see where you can, you, you can build that common ground. Sometimes you just need to change the subject from Trump versus Biden, Trump versus Obama, Trump versus the world. Who won 2020? Let's talk about the state of our schools or maybe um, you know, uh, the state of healthcare in America or you know, uh, you know, uh, some of the social problems where we do uh, of, of hunger in the United States, where I think Republicans and Democrats can find common ground and uh, work where we can on common solutions and try and model mutual respect and tolerance. So it seems as an aging baby boomer, I remember a very rich fabric of organizations and programs when I was young. There was boys state and girls state and internships in the House of Representatives and student conferences. I remember going down to Texas A&M University for a student conference on national affairs. And so it seems like there was a very rich fabric. And while perhaps philanthropy shouldn't be supporting actual electoral reform, it seems like philanthropy and even business and other sources could be helping to rebuild this richness of uh, experiences for young people to teach them consensus building and 
you know, reaching out to others and focusing on problems rather than personalities and so on. So um, I want to give a vote of appreciation and thanks uh, to uh, uh, American philanthropy uh, in two respects. Number one, they, they have been rising to the challenge uh, and they have been supporting uh, many efforts to try and reform and depolarize, strengthen and renew American democracy. Uh, the Hewlett Foundation, which is of course, uh, we take pride in, it's part of uh, our Silicon Valley and Bay Area community, has had um, a really vital forward leaning and creative program under the leadership of Daniel Stid that I think has been supporting many of these uh, reform initiatives and efforts to reduce political polarization in the United States. Um, uh, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, I think, the Ford Foundation and many others uh, provided support for this remarkable initiative that produced this report of experts about a year ago called Our Common Purpose, which I've used in my class, which uh, rolls out a much broader agenda for reforming and renewing uh, American democracy. I really recommend that report to every one of our listeners. And I want to say again, before we close, Gloria, that um, I think and fear that American democracy uh, would have really failed last year in the electoral process, that we would have had a calamitous breakdown under the strain of COVID-19 and the need for new voting technologies and so on, had it not been for the extraordinary generosity of a number of American philanthropies, uh, I'm not going to name them for uh, a reason I'll explain, that um, stepped up to the plate uh, and provided assistance uh, to ensure more efficient, uh, modern, and adequate uh, electoral administration. Uh, and it's just too bad that many of the organizations and actors uh, that have worked in this way have now been subjected to death threats because of this, uh, uh, the poison in our system uh, and all of the conspiracy theory and misinformation uh, that somehow this was stealing the election when in fact it was just trying to uh, buttress and strengthen neutral uh, and efficient electoral administration. So, um, you know, Lord knows it's not perfect. Nothing is. Everybody has their own uh, interest perspective and to some extent institutional vanity. But I've got to say, I thank God for American philanthropy. I think they... Um, are doing a lot <clears throat> to fund, support, and stimulate the civic initiative that is defending and is gonna wind up reforming and renewing American democracy. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for all your good thought on this. I know we're gonna be talking about this and many of your different uh, proposals in the months and years to come. It, it's a great plan for uh, improving and reforming our democracy. Again, thanks to Dr. Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Professor at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. We also thank you, our viewing audience. This program is a part of the Commonwealth Club's new series on the future of democracy, supported by Roy and Betsy Eisenhart. I'm Gloria Duffy. Now this program of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned.